<laughs> Welcome to the third event in the fall Abdul Poetic Reading Series. Uh, my name is Logan Pesdale, and I teach in the English department here at Chapman University. Our visiting poet today is Blas Falconer. I've got some slides. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I use this when I teach. I'm not going to go over that again. Um, I've got some slides, and I'll interrupt myself a couple times to look at them. Um, but my task, a lovely one, is to get to introduce him and to work a little bit. And then Jeremy talk about poetry. Uh, as a poet and an editor, as a teacher and a writer, as a professor of both English and creative writing at San Diego State University, and as a mentor and a muse, Blythe Falconer creates platforms for others and creates space on the page for himself. He's got three books. Uh, a Question of Gravity is Light, The Foundling Wheel, and Forgive the Body This Failure is his most recent. And he has edited two collections of essays. Uh, one that uh, called Mentor and Muse that has led to a website, which I encourage you to check out, Mentor and Muse Online. And, um, and a book uh, of essays by writers uh, about their Latinx heritage. Um, so, likes curating collections where people come together from a wide variety of backgrounds. Um, and I encourage you to check out those collections as well as his poetry. Falconer grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, which is just north of Washington, D.C. I have to look that up. Um, and in Northern Virginia. He has lived in various parts of the United States, including Texas, Tennessee, New Mexico, and now California. And through his mother, he has Puerto Rican heritage. His poems are often personal, pulling from experiences recollected and lived through, and lived with. Experience is shared experience, both having involved others and something to be shared through poems published and exchanged. He writes about family and friends, where home is, and how home is made and unmade. He writes about the body and our perception of its failures and the failure of perception. As Maria Browning has said, we can find in Falconer's poems, quote, the many varieties of grief and desire the often sorrowful love between parents and children, and the way the natural world reflects our wounded spirits back to us." Unquote. Woven into his poems are things read, an object from history, a word, and things seen. He often writes ekphrastic poems, and things heard. Formally, his poems gravitate to the unrhymed couplet, but he can also be prompted by formal constraints, such as the pantoum. So, I know this is really small, but here's a pantoum. It's this five stanzas, and I've blown it up a little bit so you can see it. The first three stanzas now, in case you don't know what a pantoum is, it's got a constraint that involves repeating lines. So. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit of it, and I hope you can see how uh, the second line in the first stanza becomes the first line in the second stanza, and the fourth line in the first stanza becomes what am I saying, the third line in the second stanza, <laughs> and then that repeats. And then there's a in the fifth stanza you get some closure because you get repetitions coming back together. Um, I love it. <laughs> the repetition, to hear lines again and again in a new context each time. So this is a ride in the rain. The driver has no knife. He has no knife, no, you think, and lower your head into his car. A ride in the rain? The dark clouds bellow. 
You saw him drinking at a local bar, you think, and lower your head into his car. Rain taps on the roof, falls on this unfamiliar man. You saw him drinking at the local bar. Did I skip local the first time? No. He shrugs and offers up his empty hands. Rain taps on the roof, falls on this familiar man, and sugarcane stalks bend in the breeze. He shrugs and offers up his empty hands as sewer pipes burst, flooding the street. So there's two more statements. Um, but just as it's something to, to notice is when the, how the poet, where the poet gravitates to, to more open forms or to constrained forms, and there's a mix in his work. Um, here are some of the images that he's written ekphrastic poems in response to. It's a, it's a particular word in the world of poetry, ekphrasis, E-K-P-H-R-A-S-I-S. And it's a poem in response to a work of visual art. So here are some of the paintings that he's written poems in response to. And I'll just show you the paintings. So. These are all in his most recent book, um, the ekphrastic poems in response to the I think some of this had to do with the 2013 exhibition at the Smithsonian, is yeah. that right? Yeah, different um, Latinx writers were invited to the Smithsonian to respond to visual art by Latinx and Latin American artists. And so I went for like four days, and every day I would um, spend the day at the Smithsonian in this collection looking for inspiration, and then I'd spend all night writing the poem, and then I had to send it to the person running the program every morning. So um, it, was a, it was like a poetry boot camp kind of thing. <laughs> but it was wonderful. It was a great, wonderful week. Yeah. It sounds like a great experience. It was. Pressure, uh, pressure on you. I didn't, Lots of pressure. Pressure. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't sleep much. <laughs> <laughs> so then I've snipped a few stanzas from three of his poems. So here's the poem Orphan which is in response to this painting. And the surface of the canvas is covered in graphite. Um, graphite manipulated in various ways. So Orphan is an acrostic poem in response to that. So these are just snips. They're just a few. Their poems are longer. Um, but I saw a theme of leave taking in this one. Orphan, I'd come to help settle your own mother's affairs. On the last night, we ate where she worked all her life. Now that she's gone, he said, I'll never come back. And the poem, Study a Boy with Flowers. A man climbs a tree. Children reach for the shaking branch. Though more than one has died with the sweet fruit's round pit caught in the throat. And from a man and a woman touched. The road littered with mangoes seemed to go on forever. She thought, the people can't eat them fast enough. As if she were not one of those people. So just a little selection of his poetry. And last thought. As Falconer has said, of his own writing over the years, and I quote him, my methods have had to change to accommodate the changes in my life. I mean that as my life changes, I must find different ways to write. And these new ways of writing force me to compose differently, to write in different modes. So the new pressures to keep poetry central in my life have also kept poetry new and exciting for me. Please join me in welcoming Blaine Spalmer to Chatham University. Yeah. Um, I'm reminded by that last quote of um, what really changed for me is I became a father. And um, we've been talking about a lot of things, including poetic forms and 
um, before in my first book. There's so many traditional forms: um, sonnets, sestinas, pantoums, lots of blank verse. Um, but then I had a son and didn't sleep much and was working full time, <laughs> and I had to find new ways to write. I couldn't because I, I would sit all day and write. It was such a luxury for me to spend an entire Sunday reading a book I loved, and then writing a couple lines, taking my dog for a walk with the book, coming back home, eating a you know tuna sandwich, and then like writing some more. So I, my life was like kind of I leisurely. I wrote leisurely, and um, and I could I could um, you know spend the day working on a sestina. Um, and I loved the way the content and form would work together. So, for example, the um, the pantoum that he just showed about, you know, where you're repeating the lines, you know, that was about a moment of indecision. Someone stopped the car. You don't know if this person is friendly or not. But, you know, the, sew the, the pipes have burst and sewage is flooding the street and it's raining. Like, you want to get in the car. Maybe there's some other reasons you might want to get in the car, <laughs> um, but um, but you don't know if this is a dangerous situation. And so what ends up happening is that the refrain of going back and forth, of repeating things, will um, will enact that indecision, that moment of indecision. So so much of my the pleasure of writing, especially that first book, was figuring out with the Sistina, how do I you know what content will work best with that form of repeating six words in a unique pattern and what would work best with blank verse, a kind of maybe a conversational kind of poem. So, um, but then when I had kids, like I said, and I um, had so little time, I, uh, I, I, I would literally think, um, I can either wash the dishes in the sink while my son takes a nap, or I can like write for 20 minutes. And it was just a mess of just images and free verse. And so then I started to write a more kind of collage like poetry. Because then I think, like months later, I'm like, what do I have? <laughs> like, let me look what's here. And, um, and that, so I, that second book was more, um, was much more influenced by, um, by a very different way of thinking about form. Um, I'm so pleased to be here. Let me say that. Thank you for coming. Um, what a lovely campus. It's so pretty here, and uh, you know, it's just kind of nice driving up and um, you know, parking so easily and walking right over here without any trouble. Um, <laughs> um, let's see. The students might disagree. <laughs> they are really what with the, with the parking Park. stuff or with what part with the campus? No, park. That's funny. <laughs> Um, so I wasn't sure who I was going to be meeting with today. I thought I uh, maybe MFA students, but um, but uh, I know some of you were in a class on rhetoric and identity, right? Wonderful! What a fascinating class. I want to sit in on that class. And then some of you are in an intro to poetry class, where you're dealing with lots of the traditions. You're kind of looking at how do you address contemporary concerns, knowing and recognizing that you're writing within a five thousand year old tradition. How amazing is that? That your voice joins this, these other voices who have had feelings like you, who have been in, out in the world, who have loved hard and been heartbroken and felt like outsiders and been betrayed and been joyful and all those things. And now it's your turn to find those tools that will best articulate what you have to say, right? And um, how uh, wonderful that you get to look back at the tradition because what a great resource, you know, that's what we've been doing all along, saying, we're going to take a little bit of that, a little bit of that, a little bit of what, you know, the Renaissance po poets were doing, a little bit of what the modernists were doing, and twist it here, and, you know, anyway, and put my own, I don't keep it my own spin. Um, so we're going to talk about poetry today, obviously. I wanted to focus on the um, particular element in poetry, and something that I often... Um, talk about with my MFA students, my graduate students at San Diego State University. Um, and something that I often think as an editor, was, I was a poetry editor for many years for the Los Angeles Review and for another literary journal before that, and um, I was an acquisitions editor for a press. And I, I read a lot of poems, 
by you know emerging poets and there's it's just this just one thing I really want to say to so many of them and um, I'm gonna say it to you today too but I want to start with this with this poem um, by Heather McHugh an American poet she talks about poetry oh no but can I can you guys hear this we were supposed to do a job in Italy and did I see a thumbs up or okay good thank you guys all right um, I think it's coming from your computer. Yeah, I know. I don't know how to make it come from that. Is there a way? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, I could look. What I could do is make this as big as possible, right? And then we'll just scroll through. Is that okay, guys? Okay. You... Our feeling for ourselves, our sense of being. So I want that to start over again. Um, technology makes me very nervous. Oh. My son is like, dude comes in here. Okay. What he thought. So stay with it, okay? Stay with the poem. She's going to take you somewhere really special. What he thought. We were supposed to do a job in Italy and full of our feeling for ourselves and our sense of being poets from America. We went from Rome to Farnham, met the mayor, mulled a couple matters over how to say Tuesday, they asked us how to say a flat drink. Among Italian literati, we could recognize our counterparts, the academic, the apologist, the arrogant, the amorous, the brazen, and the gloom. And there was one administrator, the conservative, in suit of regulation gray, who, like a good tour guide with measured chase and uninflected tone, narrate his sights and histories the hired man called us past. Of all, he was most politic and least poetic, so it seemed. Our last few days in Rome, when all but three of the new world bars had flown, I found a book of poems this unprepossessing one had written. It was there in the pensione room, a room he recommended, where it must have been abandoned by the German visitors for their among us then. that poem so many times and it never fails to move me and also to inspire me about what I'm doing when I'm writing. Um, the world has a lot of good poems. We don't need any more good poems. <laughs> We've got plenty. We need the best poems. And we might not be capable, I might not be capable of writing them, but I sure as hell am going to try, right? 
every time I write. Every time I write, it means I'm not doing something else that I could be doing. So why wouldn't I do everything I can? I wanted to begin with this because it is for many reasons a great poem. I love the tone. I love the way that it moves from one story to another to make um, to consider what is possible in poetry, what we might aim for or push ourselves towards, and how we might refuse to be complacent. One of the reasons why so many poems fail, in my opinion, is because the writer, myself included, shuts a poem down before it's fully realized. Perhaps the descriptions are strong, the line breaks uh, effective, the ending moving. But when writing, I often ask, is the poem doing everything that it wants to do, or have I played it safe? Anyone can study the individual devices, learn what it means to write a good line or interesting image. These alone do not make a good poem. It is these things working in combination. It is you exhausting everything you have. It's pushing yourself to the limits of your own abilities. I recall in my own MFA program writing a sonnet that I was particularly proud of. I took it to my professor to get feedback and was sure that he would be impressed by the image in the last line. I remember the image. It was a gold band buried in a jar of pennies. Obviously, my parents had it rough, you know, as a, as a couple. But anyway. Um, and he was impressed. After he read the poem, he nodded his head in approval. It ends well, he said, before crossing out the first 13 lines with his pen. <laughs> Why don't we start there? It was a good lesson for me, one that I must relearn each time I write a poem. We are not writing to the solid image and calling it an ending. We are not writing to impress someone with our craft. Many of us are writing to it, um, an attempt to say something meaningful, which it really has nothing to do with our egos. One of the reasons why so many of us, I think, shut a poem down before it's fully realized is because we've taken it not to the edge of our, um, not only to the edge, well, I'm sorry, uh, not to the edge of our abilities, but to the edge of our comfort. It feels like the ending, or an ending, some shift is happening in the poem that we mistake for closure. Often, however, the poem isn't calling for the ending. It's calling for a leap, a shift, a turn, another beginning. When I was a student in a workshop, we talked about this kind of thing, the way a poem moves, when we talked about sonnets, which insisted on a turn. The volta, or turn, was part of the very definition of the traditional form. Have you guys studied sonnets? Um, what do I mean by turn? Well, a narrative, imagistic, rhetorical, formal, and or linguistic shift in the poem, from description to reflection, from question to answer, from one story or image or idea to another, from statement to contradiction, a swing of the camera's lens, a new voice or tone. There are countless ways that a poem can turn. Um, is this a writing board here? Is this, is that what, is it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little concerned that those of you in the, um, the uh, rhetoric of identity aren't familiar with the just the mechanics of the of the sonnet. Are you? I don't and this is we know if we can write on this? Okay. Yeah. Alright, if you have a marker, I'll just write it really, really fast. Oh you what's that? There's a A marker? Fantastic. Oh sweet. Okay, thanks. Alright, so feel free to be this brief lesson. But I just think it's so it's so amazing. It's so wonderful and it helps you to understand so much that happens in poetry. So first you have the Italian sonnet, both, um, you know, 14 lines with a particular rhyme scheme. Uh, this is one of the more common ones. So you know you had this a particular meter, and but you had this rhyme scheme, right? There was a quatrain, four lines. There was another quatrain, four lines, and then you had two church sets, a three-line stanza and a three-line stanza. And what would happen was the, the poet would introduce a structural pattern in the rhyme. You get A, B, B, A with the rhyme scheme, right? And then you get the second stanza, A, B, B, A. So 
you're expecting what? Another egg, right? But they don't give it to you. They create this churn here, right? If they call it the volta. All of a sudden, they introduce this other end, run, end sound that doesn't work with the pattern itself. There's a kind of rupture in the structure that's been created. And you can feel it physically. Like, wait, what just happened? Something just shifted here. And usually then what would happen was that there wasn't just a shift in the formal quality of the poem. There was some sort of um, rhetorical shift, some other like um, shift in the content, right? So maybe um, this was description and this was reflection. Um, maybe uh, there was some sort of rhetorical gesture like if, blah, 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 then da, 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 right? So you're getting the, um, the uh, rhetorical shift was enforced by or reinforced by the formal shift. So it's a lot harder to write an Italian sonnet. I'm like, what did I do here? Um, okay. In English. Because it's a lot harder to rhyme in English, right? You know, if you write in a Romance language, it's a lot of words end the same. <laughs> so, but in English, it's a little bit more challenging. So, of course, they modified it for their own uses. And they found that, you know, three quatrains, right, instead of having an octave and a sesta at eight and six, they would have three quatrains and a couplet. And they would do the same thing, the same um, logic. Start off with the pattern A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G. You're going to get an H, but we don't. The poem shuts. G, right? We experience it physically, a sense of closure. So musically, what's happening is um, the bot, like we're being told, like, this is over. This, something else has happened, right? And so if you've read Shakespeare or any sonnet, you know that oftentimes that an argument is created here. Right? And then here, when there is a kind of shift in the um, form, there's usually some sh shift in the argument as well. Right? So a lot of times there's like a bitter, angry person, <laughs> angry at their lover. It's, they're you know, mad because they cheated or left the, him or whatever. And so here's all the bitterness and hate. <laughs> and then here's the like, but please take me back. You know, something like that. Right? So anyway, so, oh, so that's like the... I, I think that that logic is really important if you're studying poetry or you're understand, you know, trying to under to write poetry, and that is that you have these elements, structural elements that, that ground you, make you feel like you know where you are, and then you have these elements that disrupt the pattern. That both are really important in poetry. Um, I will say this also. One of my former professors. Um, pointed out that after the eighth line, there was often in the English sonnet or the Shakespearean sonnet, what she called a ghost term. Um, and it was a nod to the origin of the form, right? So there would be a smaller turn or volta here, and then a, str uh, a very strong one here, right? So to me, what I love about the English sonnet or the Shakespearean sonnet is that often it doesn't just have two gestures, but three gestures. So, the, so what, when you have a gesture, when you have a turn, it's like, sorry, it's like you're pushing yourself. This is what I think about something, and you say it, right? We can all say what we think about, you know, somebody, right? But then if I say, okay, give me more. Oh, okay, uh, you start to think more about it. Then you say something a little deeper, right? And then if you end, look at your end. But if I said, wait, I want more. Push harder, right? So then the poem pushes a little bit deeper. And so I feel like in the English song, oh, that happens quite a bit. Um, that will be a <laughs> uh, I want to look at a contemporary version of one. I think I have one here. Where is it? Not Disney Plus. <laughs> where are Andor, so good. If you haven't watched it, so good. Um, where is it, though? Where is my... I thought I had my Google Doc here. Let me see all my. I think it's here. I thought I pulled it up. Okay, okay, it's okay, I'll find it. Um, Chapman, I'll see it there. 
Okay. So here's a contemporary uh, sonnet um, by Bruce Smith. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause at the ghost turns. It's written in the English form. And I'm going to pause at the ghost turn. I'm going to pause at the turn. And I want you to imagine the poem that ends before the turn, which is where I think a lot of people end their poem. Like, oh, this is pretty good. I'm going to end it here. <laughs> right? And then I want you to think about how much better the poem is because the poet wasn't complacent, but pushed himself after St. Vincent Millay. So remember the themes, unrequited love, I've been wronged. When I saw you again, distant, sparrow-boned, under the elegant clothes you wear in your life without me, I thought, no, no. Let her be the one this time to look up at an oblivious me. Let her find the edge of the cliff with her foot blindfolded. Let her be the one struck by the lightning of the other so that the heart is jolted from the ribs and the rest of the body is nothing but ash. It's a sad, familiar story I wish you were telling me with this shabby excuse. I never loved you any more than I hated myself for loving you. And about that other guy by your side you left me for, I hope he dies. <laughs> so good, right? I'm like, I mean, just so good. I don't know why whenever I read this poem, I imagine this bookstore in Houston when I went to grad school. I must have had this similar experience. <laughs> so I somehow know it well. But anyway, but you can hear the pause. That first, you can you can hear the first rhetorical shift. Let, win this, no, let this, let that. That's the first like, rhetorical gesture. Then we go into this reflection. It's a sad, familiar story. I wish you were telling me. And this is just so brilliant. I never loved you more than I hated myself. <laughs> so mean. But anyway, and then, of course, the final gesture with this couplet. Side dies. You can see the rhyme scheme. Bone, one, me, me, foot, jolted, lightning, nothing. Maybe slant rhymes. Story, you know, so anyway. Um, so... Story more than, isn't that great? Great rhyme. So anyway, so here we have, a, I think it's a great example of um, the poem that is, um, you know, creates patterns and structures but then pushes past them with the term. Um, but what about our poems that aren't written in the traditional sonnet form, that don't have a formal rhyme scheme to guide or encourage a term? As a student, I remember talking about imagery, line breaks, meter. We talked about titles and themes, narrative and the lyric. But I didn't talk about the way a poem moved from idea to idea or image uh, to image. Why? Because it's not a known or fixed pattern. It's not embedded in the code of the form, right? The rhyme scheme. After the octave, for example, after the third quatrain. So it's difficult to talk about. It can happen anywhere and any way, and the movement of the poem establishes its own unique relationship to all the other devices at play. Rhyme, meter, narrative, theme, etc. Right? And that's what I want us to think about today, the movement of a poem, what Gregory Orr calls the imagination, and how this movement contributes to the poem and enriches our experiences as readers. My hope is that talking about the way a poem moves or doesn't move We'll keep it at the forefront of our minds when reading and writing um, our own poems. So we're going to move kind of quickly um, and just look at some poems and how it move, how they move, and and we can keep this model in mind, right? These are not sonnets; these are contemporary free verse, for the most part, free verse poems. Um, but you can see how they're influenced by this, you know. How many hundreds of year old tradition? Like, anyway, first sonnet, like with 15th century, 14th century, right? So, anyway, long time. All right, Purple Bathing Suit by Louise Glick. Okay, so this is what I want you to do. I'm going to read this. You don't get the rhyme scheme, but I want you to be sensitive to shifts happening. When do you notice like something shift? For me, that's what. To be honest with you, I used to be so shy because I was like, how, is it, how do I? 
these other students know what to say. I don't know what to say. I'm just overwhelmed, right? And so I was looking for like the right phrase or the right thing. I would study analyses, and then I realized I had it all wrong. The trick is to focus on yourself. Where do you feel things happening in you? That's the whole secret to all the reading, is why, wait, that just confused me. Why? Wait, that just made me excited. Why? That is how you become a stellar reader, right? And not just repeat everything other people say, right? And so, focus on your own response to this poem. Purple bathing suit. I like to watch you garden with your back to me in your purple bathing suit. Your back is my favorite part of you, the part furthest away from your mouth. You might give some thought to that mouth. Also to the way you weed, breaking the grass off at ground level when you should pull it by the roots. How many times do I have to tell you how the grass spreads, your little pile notwithstanding, in a dark mass, which, by smoothing over the surface, you have finally fully obscured. Watching you stare into space in the tidy rows of the vegetable garden, ostensibly working hard while actually doing the worst <laughs> job possible, I think you are a small, irritating, purple thing, and I would like to see you walk off the face of the earth because you are all that's wrong with my life, and I need you, and I claim you. <laughs> Good, right? All right. So, I love this poem. I love this poem. I love how it's, it's good because it turns, right? It isn't a rant. It is more complicated than a rant. And do we feel uh, resentment toward just about everybody in our lives at some point in time? Of course we do, right? But it's not just an expression of frustration, right? It's much more complicated than that. But it's funny, too. And, it's, and this is the other thing I want to say about poetry. You don't need to understand it. You don't need to understand it. You just need to experience it. I do think there's a lot of pleasure in understanding it. Like, why did I just think that was hilarious? Why do I keep thinking about this poem? Then I dive in and I understand it. But you don't need to. It's like when you go, like, I go to the museum with my mom, and she's like, what does it mean? I'm like, just stop. stop. It's a rock it doesn't, doesn't mean anything. Just, just experience it. So I, I, I want to say first, appreciate the poem. Then, for fun, ask yourself, why did I laugh? Why did that bother me? Why did that upset me? Why did that confuse me? Then that's the pleasure, right? That's when you're on, you start to think, like, you know, about all the mechanics working together. Of course, in the first stanza, it feels like a moment of an adoration, a, moment, a loving moment. I like watching you garden. You're back to me and you're then you start to like, wait a second. You're back to my favorite party. You're like, I don't, am I reading that right? Am I reading that? Like, I personally read them like, wait, I'm confused. But then when we get to the second stanza, it's like I just dropped into a whole other level of, of the speaker's feelings toward the you. You might give some thought to that mouth. I mean, that's like a mom <laughs> talking to a child. That is like condescending. She is like full of barbs, right? She's ready to, you know, have it out with them. But she's actually, I can imagine her quite like just watching him, like, and all the resentments bubbling over, and she's not saying anything, right? Then we get to the next stanza, and I feel like another, like, I get to understand, it's like this, the poem delves deeper into the psyche of the speaker, right? The next one we have this extended metaphor. Right? How many times do I have to tell you how the grass spreads? I mean, of course, it's literal, right? He's there. I used to do this as a child. I'm like, oh my God, just rip out the tops of the weeds. And of course, I was doing the worst thing you could do. All those weeds were growing even bigger underneath the soil and killing all the plants. But I was lazy as a child and whatever. So it was Saturday and it was hot. So anyway, so, um, but that becomes, so there's a literal truth, but there's also a figurative truth. This is resonating as an image. You can feel it, like... 
what is that dark, um, you know, mass underneath that's growing that you can't see, right? As her anger and resentment starts to boil over. I love this. Your little pile of nothing. I mean, it's just like, you know. But, um, and then we get to this, like, practical death wish. And it will or, or no. I would like to see you walk off the face of the earth because you are all that is. I mean, it is like hyperbolic at this point. <laughs> I mean, it's like, but then this end, the last turn. Psh, I mean, didn't you feel it? And I need you. And I claim you. I mean, um, I just think, I feel like she just spun the whole, spun me around, spun the poem around. I love so much. That we could go and dive in. I can look at this. What I love is and and kind of gives this sense of accumulation happening, right? Um, this and that. Right? So that turn is what makes the poem a poem. Otherwise, it's an observation or it's a rant. It's not very interesting. I might read it once and not come back to it. Why? Why I come back to it? Um, for sake of time, I'm going to jump past this next one. But um, I, ha I have a um, Google Doc that you guys can read. It's got lots of poems that turn in, inter in interesting ways. So I encourage you to like read them and have fun with them. This, this is another one. The writer, so great. Anyway, I'm not going to get up Here's one. We're going to just stick with this. Um, it's okay that we go over a little bit. Is it, I mean, okay, all right. So um, I'm going I'm to go fast, but um, I want to get to my point here, which is, I think, important. So this is called Mummy of a Lady Named Jamuta Sonic by Thomas James. Um, uh, an American poet, died in the early 1970s. And I want to tell you a little story about it. When I was getting my MFA, I found this old anthology in a used bookstore. And in the anthology, there was a selection of poems by this poet. I'd never heard of it. So I went to the Library of Congress with my best friend, and we covertly Xeroxed the whole book. Um, <laughs> so we would have a copy of it. And um, what was fascinating, what we noticed is that um, the book was dedicated to um, his parents, both of whom had died the year before the book was published. And we found out that he had died himself that year that it was published. He had committed suicide. I think it's relevant to this poem. All of it. So, Mummy of a Lady Named Jamuta Sonic. Obviously, this is a dramatic monologue. It's been written in the voice of the mummy. Notice how you feel when you're hearing it. My body holds its shape. The genius is intact. Will I return to Thebes? In that lost country, the eucalyptus trees have turned to stone. Once, branches nudged me, dropping swollen blossoms, and passion flowers lit my father's garden. Is it still there, that place of mottled shadow, the scarlet flowers breathing in the darkness? I remember how I died. It was so simple. One morning, the garden faded, my face blacked out. On my left side, they made the first incision. They washed my heart and liver and palm wine. My lungs were too dark fruit they stuck with spices. They smeared my innards with a sticky unguent and sealed them in a crock of alabaster. My brain was next. A pointed instrument hooked it through my nostrils, strand by strand. A voice swayed over me. I paid no notice. For weeks, my body swam in sweet perfume. I came out scoured. I was skin and bone. They lifted me into the sun again and packed my empty skull with cinnamon. They slipped my toes. A razor gashed my fingertips. Stitched shut at last, my limbs were chaste and valuable, stuffed with paste of cloves and wild honey. My eyes were empty, so they filled them up, inserting little nuggets of obsidian. A basalt scarab wedged between my breasts, replaced with the tinny music of my heart. Hands touched my sutures. I was so important. They oiled my pores, rubbing a fragrance in. An amber gum oozed down to soothe my temples. I wanted to sit up. My skin was luminous, frail as the shadow of an emerald. Before I learned to love myself too much, my body wound itself in spools of linen. 
Shut in my painted box, I am a precious object. I wear a wooden mask. These are my eyelids, two flakes of bronze, and here is my new mouth, chiseled with care, guarding its ruby facets. I will last forever. I am not impatient. My skin will wait to greet its old complexions. I'll lie here till the world swims back again. When I come home, the garden will be budding, white petals breaking open, clusters of night flowers, the far-off music of a tambourine. A boy will pace among the passion flowers, his eyes no longer two bruised surfaces. I'll know the mouth of my young groom. I'll touch his hands. Why do people lie to one another? I, I remember reading this poem uh, to a class um, once, and one of the students was weeping at the end. And I said, why are you weeping? She said, I don't know. <laughs> but I think I do. I mean, we talked about it. <laughs> that last line, why do people lie to one another? If you don't have that line, that term, this is just a description. It's not a poem. It's just a description, right? But when you get that, you're, the leap is so shocking, right? Because we're so sure, the voice is so sure that she's going to meet her beloved again. Mm -hmm. And then we get that. And then we're like, lie. What mm -hmm. lie? And then the lie that she tells herself, that she is going to meet her, her love again. And then there's, of course, the lie that there's a mummy speaking to us in this poem, right? <laughs> this is a man in the 70s, you know, writing in the voice of a woman centuries beforehand about death and the afterlife, whose parents just died, who was thinking about death himself, who committed suicide, asking himself these questions. Why do we lie to one another? How do we lie to ourselves, right? That's a personal thing. It doesn't matter what you believe about the afterlife. This is a reflection of this speaker, right? And what he does by managing to turn, to turn from the present to the past, to this catalog, back to the past, to this last line, is he's digging deeper and digging deeper until he gets to that question of where, where's the lie, you know, right? this kind of breaking of denial. Um, I, I hate that we're moving, we have to move so quickly, but I do feel it's like I need to get to this last poem because this is the opposite that can happen. This is, this is you know, when I have the poet who all he or she or they want to do is turn. <laughs> turn, turn, turn. It's like this, there's no rhyme or reason to it. And when that person, when that kind of poet comes my way, I remind them that we need to balance things out with the patterns that we have available to us, the rhetorical structures, story, rhyme scheme, rhythm, repetition, Whatever, whatever patterns you can create to balance the surprise with the young, um, with something that, that lets the reader know where they are in a poem, okay? So to me, when I get a turn, I feel like it's almost like something's out of slipping away from me, and I have to grab it again, right? That's what happened. Why do people lie to me? I'm like, wait, what? And then I'm like, okay, I got it. It makes sense. It isn't just some random thing. It makes sense within the world of the poem. But I do feel like it's kind of getting away from me and I have to catch up with it. There's that little hiccup. And, um, and if you have a poem that's just turning, 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 and I don't know where I am, then I'm just kind of like, I don't know. I, it's just like random things being thrown at me. So you need to find these devices that will ground us and let the reader know where you are. So just kind of summing things up, it's like you need, I think of a poem as having two impulses. The impulse to let the reader know where they are, give them familiar territory, but then also um, aim for the unknowable too, the mysterious and um, the transcendent, right? Both, you need both in your poems. You just have one, we're bored. You have the other, we're confused, right? But together, we can, we can um, experience that transcendence with you. We can, ex we can touch the unknowable because you've shown us how to get there, okay? So let's look at one more poem by Jericho Brown. 
contemporary Pulitzer Prize winning um, gay African American poet um, who writes a lot about um, trauma, abuse, love. And he invented a form called the duplex. And it's kind of like a, uh, he's taken the sonnet and he's made it his own. And he's decided to, um, to, to kind of, to reinvent this form. And basically it's written in couplets and every couplet will have a repetition and a leap. You must turn. So the repetition grounds you. You know where you are because you're hearing a familiar phrase, but then you have to leap towards something new. And let's see where you go. That's the scary thing. Okay. Duplex. A poem is a gesture toward home. It makes dark demands I call my own. Memory makes demands darker than my own. My last love drove a burgundy car. My first love drove a burgundy car. He was fast and awful, tall as my father. Steadfast and awful, my tall father hit hard as a hailstorm. He'd leave marks. Light rain hits easy, but leaves its own mark. Like the sound of a mother weeping again. Like the sound of my mother weeping again. No sound beating ends where it began. None of the beaten end up how we began. A poem is a gesture toward home. So here we've begun with this statement about a poem. And then with each stanza, each couplet, introduces something wildly new. So, um, but we are grounded because of the, you can see him taking from the line beforehand, and then he leaps, and then he gets to say something new. And in this short poem, he addresses poetry, he addresses memory, um, love, the beloved, um, the father's physical abuse, the lover's physical abuse, what the father did to the speaker, what the father did to the mother, and then how that ripples out, right? How that trauma is um, present in, in, his, in his own life now, right? And so I know that we're rushing past this, but I don't, um, I know that we're also like short on time. So um, I want to end there, but let me, with that poem, but let me kind of try and sum things up. Um, so often in the great poem, alongside the impulse to hold the text together through various devices like narrative, repetition, meter, rhyme, metaphor, any pattern, there is the destructive impulse. Turns are part of the destructive impulse because they threaten the coherence of the poem. They break from a moment, a story, a train of thought. The turn is a departure from what we know, a tear in the fabric, a rupture. We need both in a poem. We need to have our footing, to be grounded, as we often say, and to fly, to touch the transcendent or the unknowable. Consider this balance in your own poems. Maybe we stop short of greatness because we get scared that the poem will fall apart, that we won't be able to balance these two forces, that we'll lose control. So instead, we write the safe draft, where we don't push ourselves where we've said something somewhat interesting and demonstrated our own skills. The line breaks work, the image compelling, everything tidy enough. But why not push past the ghost turn of our poems and leap far from our sense of comfort? From what we already know, we know. Who cares? You don't write to say what you know. You write to discover what you didn't know you knew, <laughs> right? To write the great poem, that's what it takes. The elements that create coherence along those that threaten it. Heather McHugh's poem ends by defining poetry as what the dying man thought but couldn't say. And I hope we aspire to that definition. Thank you. poems by Juan Felipe Herrera, poems by Vaidi Francis, just tons of contemporary poets that I think also offer kind of interesting examples of turning and grounding. So, thank you very much. You want
We have five minutes. Fine, right, whatever you want. I just, just, uh, yes. do want to tell everybody that there are books available. That's just over here. Um, but yeah, we have five okay. minutes. That's fine. Happy to answer any questions. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Because um, um, I was thinking about it pretty much, not the whole time, but it was bothering my mind, right, when you read The Purple Bathing Suit, and you kept speaking as if the person speaking was like an adult, like a woman, right? Yes, yes. And I don't know if that's because you know something that I don't, since I know very little context. Mm -hmm. But it was, to me, it was very interesting because when I, I closed my eyes and listened to you read it, I saw like a little boy watching from a window, a girl that's his neighbor. Uh, and for me, it was like his, his um, battle between him so confused being so young, but being so enamored with her. And like, so I wanted to understand from your perspective how you got it being a woman. Yeah. Um, well, I, I always think there's a difference between the speaker and the poet. Mm -hmm. But it kind of helps to shape, I mean, I mean, I wouldn't assume it's a man or a woman, like mm -hmm. generally, like, but it was written by a woman. And so I will assume I have to choose something. I will assume it's a woman, right? And so, um, and there's a sense to me of familiarity. You're all that's wrong with my life. So I feel like there is a closeness there and up there. And I think that the resentment is so profound. I hope you walk off the face of this earth. You are all that is wrong with my life. That feels like somebody's let their resentment, like, Someone's like, I don't like the way he breathes. I don't like the way he chews his food. You know, like you can see it's like, it's like really reasonable. You know, it's not a real, re I mean, so um, so to me it felt more adult-like, right? I have read analyses of that poem where um, one, Diane Lockwood said, she always imagined it as a um, man looking, a husband looking at a wife, right? Um, something about the per it being a purple bathing suit um, but when I get, I like your back, like that could be a woman like go to the back side, you know, like, or is it, you know, we don't know. So <laughs> like, what are they, like, so anyway, so you, you could read it anyway. You think all we have is a poem and we get to decide what we think. Yeah. Why do you think she wrote and and not but at the end? Oh, because mm -hmm. they're both true. How much better is and than but? But is what it's like, but I need you. No, it's like, and I need you. It's like, those all exist. It's like, it's not, you know, it's like not an argument between the two. Like, one's going to win out. Like, that's what, you know, you live, you got to live with those resentments and those, you know, like they're all there together. That's, that's adult relationships. Those are adult relationships. <laughs> you know, like they're going to drive you crazy when they chew and, you know, they're going to do out something you love, you know, but... Um, so yeah, I think that the and is what makes it, this just shows you like how important a line break is. A, and every word is important. And and is like, in addition to those first however many lines, and I need you. And I claim you. Mm -hmm. So good, yeah. What other questions? Yeah. Okay, two, one is logistic. Uh, where do we find Google Doc with the poems? And then my substantive question would be about your anthologies and what your goal is or how you approach those. Great questions. Um, so I gave um, a, a, a link to the Google Doc so that every, anyone can access it. I hope you love these poems. I really was trying to be careful to pick um, a lot of um, uh, poems with diverse voices, <laughs> themes, and different styles, free verse, floating on the page, formal verse, you know, familiar ones, new ones, so I hope, I hope you enjoy those. I wrote, um, I co-edited two anthologies. I love working with other people. So much of writing is private and quiet, and I like that too. I'm more introverted, really, than extroverted, but, um, but I do, we have to find ways to connect with people. It's also an excuse to do things with friends. Really. So, um, one, the first one was Mentor Muse Essays from Poets to Poets. And what had happened was my friends and I always wanted to get together. So, we would meet at these conferences where we would present at panels. And we were all teachers of poet teaching at universities. And so, we kind of thought, let's do have a pedagogical panel where we talk about poems 
that have seem to demonstrate an expertise in a particular area? And then what did we learn from that poem about that expertise and how do we see it in our own work? How do you know how can we reflect that learning in our own work? And so we started doing that and they're like, I think we've got an anthology. We did it so many times, I think we might have an anthology here. So then we did a call and we got all these other people to write essays. The second one was um, I did it again. There was a panel that I did called The Other Latino. About the time it was Latino. This was in the 2008 or something, 2007. We didn't have Latinx then. But um, I'm Puerto Rican, but I'm half Puerto Rican. My father was born in Erie, Pennsylvania, the son of a milkman. You know, and like my mom grew up in a tiny fishing village in Puerto Rico, but somehow they ended up together and I came about. So, um, but my, uh, but I was, I identify as Puerto Rican, you know, I, you know, anyway, so I, um, I didn't see a lot of my own experiences reflected in the poems that were being published. And I think that was uh, um, back then when, when publishers were trying to create more diversity, um, they were, you know, pushing to publish Latinx um, poems by Latinx people, but they needed to somehow commodify it. They needed to, like, sell it. So they'd be like, okay, Puerto Ricans, all Puerto Ricans from New York, you know, all of them write like this. Then we can sell it like that. This is what Puerto Ricans do. I'm like, wait. <laughs> there are a lot of us who are living in urban centers and who aren't part of that kind of community. My relationship with Puerto Rico was direct to my family in Puerto Rico, I would see all the time. And so, and my mother. And, and so, um, so I have a very different aesthetic too. And so I, so I started, I, I was, I kind of, created a panel at a conference with three other friends with unique experiences. One, Lisa Chavez, Lisa Chavez. She's um, Chicana, but her mom, white mother, moved to Alaska and moved with her. And there were no other Chicanas there. And so she was like, they just, the native community just took her in. And so she just kind of, like she's obviously native, but she doesn't know what tribe she's from. And, but she kind of like got embraced by this. So it was this weird, identity where she got kind of um, taken care of by this other community because her mother didn't really understand what was happening to her. So she was on the community. Anyway, so, you know, Cuban-American, right? So we all um, presented, and an um, uh, acquisitions editor from a press came up to me and said, would you want to put together an anthology? I was like, of course. So we did it. I, I reached out to my friend, Lorraine Lopez, who's a fiction writer. She kind of fiction writer at um, Vanderbilt University and asked her if she wanted to do it with me. And she said, yep. And so we kind of like, we're really, you know, I said, you pick 10 authors, I'll pick 10 authors. We solicited them. They wrote the essay, put them together, and the University of Arizona published that. So they kind of like, was a way, a response to what the presses were doing and saying, hey, there's diversity within the diversity here. Don't forget about like the different kinds of voices. It's good, good intentions, but also kind of in effect silencing a lot of other voices. So, any other last questions before I, you guys run off and do what maybe that's possible? Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Well, thank you so much. Run through, but hopefully, you can kind of go back to the ideas and um, think about them when you have more time. <laughs>